Well, good morning. <laughs> There's a three or four of you out there awake. How about? <laughs> well, um, I want to do a little bragging this morning. Uh, I hope you got a Bible. Turn with me to Luke 15. We're going to look at the prodigal son while you're turning in your copy of God's Word or turning on your phone, hopefully not checking Facebook or whatever. Uh, I want to show you something that was on Facebook. It's actually this picture behind me. Uh, it's a picture of our, uh, at our high school and middle school this past Wednesday for See You at the Pole. And these are students from a bunch of different youth groups and churches in our area. There are some students that probably don't go to church and they were there. And I had somebody ask me once, Brandon, don't you think that's a little hypocritical that there's some kids that just kind of show up and make a show of, of see at the pole. And, and to be honest with you, I'm all for it. I'm not for being a hypocrite, but I'm all for these students being there because I promise you God was there. And uh, it is an awesome thing for our young people uh, to come and to pray. And of course, I challenged our kids, our students, don't just pray for your school and your country one day out of the year. Do it every single day. You don't have to get, go around the flagpole to do that. You can, you can do that every single day. Now, why am I bringing this up? I want to brag on our students, but I also want to brag on our Whitehall Police Department. They have been sponsoring this, the breakfast we do afterwards. After they pray, they come down to our, our gym down the street at the activities building. And they, uh, they, they've, been, they've been paying for them to eat breakfast for the past few years. And I love telling young people, your police department did this for you. I think it is such a great, great thing. So let's give the Whitehall PD, a big hand for that. Thank you so much. And also, we need to thank our senior adults. I love that our senior adults, for goodness, almost 30 years, has been a part of this breakfast. I think the first year they did it back in the early 90s, they did donuts or something. Well, let me tell you, it wasn't donuts this week. It was some good food, right, students? It's awesome. And uh, let's give a big hand to our senior adults for what they do. Thank you, thank you. Um, so this, this message is one of the messages we were, we've been looking at this fall uh, at Wednesday nights at Crosswalk. Uh, I've been going through some of the parables of Jesus, and we've been calling them Jesus jams. You know, like Jesus is jamming out and all that, and you're like, what, what's that mean? Here's the deal. Jesus used parables to teach, okay? And uh, basically a parable, if you don't know, it's an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. So Jesus would use a story that was set in everyday life that anybody could relate to listening and he was trying to get them to understand he was talking about a spiritual thing. All right? And, um, and, and we've got a gold mine of parables in Luke chapter 15. If you don't know the Bible real well, trust me, Luke 15 is a gold mine. And, and here's why. Because of what happened to prompt Jesus to use parables. So before we can look at the prodigal son, we need to understand what, may, what prompted Jesus to tell this story and who's he telling the story to. So Luke, at the beginning of Luke chapter 15, you'll see it on the screen if you've got your Bible open, you can read along. It says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came, you might want to underline often came, to listen to Jesus teach. Now that right there in and of itself blows my mind. Now, let me just paint a picture for you. These are not church-going people. These are people that are far from it. These are people that when they walk into a room or they walk down the street, everybody thinks of a word we probably can't say in here. The, their reputation precedes themselves negatively. And this, these were the kind of folks that loved Jesus and Jesus loved them. And they would listen to Jesus Speak often. This wasn't a, well, it was a fluky day and they just happened to be there. No, they made a habit of coming and hearing Jesus teach. That's a very convicting verse for me as a believer. Because I believe when I gave my life to Jesus that the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. God's Word says it. Many of you are believers. And, the, and this Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. And I often wonder, do people who don't darken the door of a church like being around me? Now, I probably already know the answer to that. It's a convicting verse. That is what Jesus was all about. He came to seek those who were sick, those who were lost. And we keep forgetting that. We keep thinking He came just to get the good people. And we all know, if we read the Bible, there is not good, no one good, no, not one. 
So this is what's going on. And then to complicate things, while Jesus is doing his regular teaching with these notorious sinners, it says, this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain. They got mad. Why? Because Jesus was associating with such sinful people and he was even eating with them. That is the most unbaptist thing you can do, right? Eating, oh, he's, he's not just hanging out with them. He's eating with them, Brandon. They went to Popeye's together, Brandon. Y'all, they're mad. And if you don't know the Bible very well, the Pharisees are religious people. They're people that knew the Old Testament better than you and me put together. They knew everything God had said in His Word from that point up, up to that point. And, 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 and they, knew, they knew all the boxes to check, y'all. And, and they dressed the part. They walked the part. They acted the part. They dotted the I's and crossed the T's and loved to tell everybody else how they didn't dot the I's and cross the T's. So this is the background for this story, this parable that we're about to read out of Luke chapter 15. Jesus goes on in Luke 15 and he tells the story about the good shepherd leading, leaving the 99 to go after the one. Like he would leave the, all the 99, which makes no sense to a lot of us. 99 is pretty good on a test, but he would go after the one because the good shepherd always sees the one who's not there. He always sees the one who, who you know, and then and he tells the story of the woman who lost a coin and, and how she did everything she could to go find it. See, if you lose something... Like if you lose a piece of jewelry, you don't go to your drawer and open your drawer and say, Wow, look at all the jewelry I got. I know I lost that one, but oh, I got all this. No, you only think about what you lost. And that's what Jesus is trying to get these people to understand, the audience, these Pharisees to understand. I am, I am broken. I love the ones I have, but I am broken over those that I don't. And so he tells the story of the prodigal son. There are three people in this parable, and uh, we're going to look at each person. I hope you'll take some notes. You got a handout in your bulletin, take some notes, let this sink in in your heart, and, and God will do some great things, uh, I believe, because it's coming from His Word. So let's look at it very quickly. Three people in this parable. The first is the prodigal son. The prodigal son. You want to write that down, prodigal son. I, you don't even have to be a church-going person to know the term prodigal son. The prodigal comes home. It is in our culture, and it comes from this story Jesus told. And, uh, and so let me show you some pictures up here on the screen. All these people have one thing in common. There's uh, MC Hammer. Can't touch this. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, you know, I'm not going to dance. Okay, You got Allen Iverson. He used to play for the 76ers. Practice, you know. Um, you got Tory, uh, Tony Braxton over here on the right. You got Burt Reynolds. You got Mark Twain. You got Kurt Schilling. You got Mike Tyson. Interesting tattoo. You've got um, um, Nicholas Cage. And you got Floyd Mayweather. What do all these people have in common? They had it all and they squandered it. They had more, they've wasted more money than you and I will see in a lifetime. They had all these riches and they filed for bankruptcy because they just recklessly and frivolously spent. Well, that's what the definition of a prodigal is. Okay, We say the prodigal son. A prodigal is someone who spends money and resources freely and recklessly and they're wastefully extravagant. They just blow money on things and thinking they'll always have it. But you know what happens? The money runs out and the circumstances change. Well, let's take a look. At the prodigal son. This is Luke 15, starting with verse 11. So to illustrate the point with these Pharisees further about how Jesus came to seek and save the lost, he tells them this story. This is the third story that he just told this group. He says, there was a man, he had two sons. The younger son, who is the prodigal son, we'll find out later, told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. That is highly unusual in that culture, to get the inheritance before the parent passes away. But the younger, and by the way, in, in that culture, the older son got the best because he was older. Well, this is the younger son. So the younger son goes up to the dad and says, I want my money now. Come on, time's a wasting, Pop. I got things to do. I got places to go. I got people to see. I want my money now. It's mine, Dad. Give it to me. So the father agreed to divide his wealth between both of his sons. 
So he gave the older son, who didn't ask for it, his money and his inheritance. And he gave the younger son, who was demanding it, his. Now watch what happens. You guys probably know this story. A few days later, the younger son packed all his stuff up and he moved to a distant land. He got out of town. He wasn't going to be growing up in a small town. He had to get out of town. And he went to this far land and it says there he wasted, he squandered all his money in wild living. Y'all, he didn't just buy things he didn't need. He participated in sinful things and paid for it. He got entertainment and threw his money away. And he lived wildly and recklessly. And about the time his money ran out, look what happened. A great famine came along, swept over the land, and he began to starve. So not only did he run out of his money, not only did he run out of his money, but then there was a famine, and so no one had any food to give him. They couldn't spare the food. They had to have what little they had for themselves. So he couldn't you know, stand on a corner with a sign and, and say, as you leave Walmart, and say, give me the money. He couldn't because nobody had any to go to Walmart in the first place. Things were that terrible in the land at the time. Let's keep going. So he persuaded a local farmer to hire him. He's so desperate, he goes from living in the penthouse to the outhouse, and he goes to the farmer, and he says, please, please, please hire me. And so the man says, okay, I'll hire you. And he sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. Most likely, this person, being that Jesus was Jewish... The audience he was talking to is Jewish. It doesn't say this guy was Jewish, but probably the assumption is this guy's Jewish. And the Pharisee hearing this, when he hears that a Jewish guy did bad things and he stooped that low and he went off and blew his inheritance to the point where he had to get a job working with pigs when every good Jew would know that the law teaches you cannot eat or be around pigs, swine, anything like that. It was an unclean no-no. No bacon, y'all. All All right? I'm for real. No bacon. They couldn't have it. They couldn't have ham. So the fact that he is around these pigs tells you how bad it is. And it says the young man became so hungry. He was in such a bad place. He was so rock bottom that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. The slop he gave the animals he wasn't even supposed to touch or be around Looked appealing to him. That is how rock bottom bad it got for this young man. And then the sad verse here. It says, but no one gave him anything. Listen. I'm talking to some folks in here. And I love you. And I'm saying this in love. Please hear me say this in love. If you continue to live your life pushing your heavenly father away. He's going to let you go. But I thought God's a loving God. Yes, He is. But He's going to respect your decision to have it your way. You see, your Heavenly Father, well, if you keep living in a way where you might say one thing with your mouth, I know I'm talking to people in a church on a Sunday morning in the Bible Belt, and I realize, wow, we're ahead of the game because look, we're here and look who's not here. Listen, I don't care. You can be in a church every Sunday and keep pushing the hand of God away. It's an attitude. It's a desire of the heart. If you keep pushing the hand of God away and I don't need you, I don't need you, I don't need you, God will say, okay, and He'll let you go. He'll let you have it your way. He'll let you hit rock bottom. He doesn't want rock bottom for you, but he'll let you hit rock bottom. Because sometimes people are only going to learn when they hit rock bottom. And by the way, when you hit rock bottom like this young man in Jesus' parable, there is only one place to look. You can just keep digging, and you've hit as far as you can go, or you can look up. And some people have to hit rock bottom to look up. I hope you're not that person. But if you are here today, if you're listening to this right now, and you have hit rock bottom, I have got great news for you. There is only one more place you can go, and that is up if you want to go. But you've got to want to go. You're not going to have the Heavenly Father yanking you out of the pit you dug yourself in. Because you wanted to be there. You see, every road we get on goes somewhere. And at the time when we start down the road, it might seem great and glorious. But we've got to ask ourselves, where are these people going, and why am I going with them? Because every road will lead you somewhere. 
So look what happens with the young man. When he finally, this is verse 17 of Luke 15. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. And I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned to his father. So the attitude, he, he, he comes now, he, he left in pride, and he's coming back in humility. He's not coming back saying, Dad, I'm still your son, give me, give me some more. He's coming back saying, Dad, I'm not worthy to be your son. I goofed up, I messed up, I'll just be a servant. It would be better to be a slave in your house, a servant in your house, than to be where I'm at right now. You know when we change? When the pain of where we are is greater than the pain it would take to change. A lot of us say, oh, I want to change. Oh, I repent. Let me tell you something. Repentance doesn't happen by just crying. Repentance happens when the pain of where you are is greater than the pain of, 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 of humbling yourself and going back. And this young man humbled himself and he decided to go home. Maybe you're here today. And you've made a series of bad choices. And when you started down the road, you didn't even know you were making bad choices. You just kind of went with the flow. And you've drifted from God. Or maybe you've deliberately said, I am done with God and done religion. And for some crazy reason, you're here listening to this youth pastor up here talk about Luke 15. Well, I'm telling you something. You're not too far gone. You can still come home. If you want to. The father didn't chase the son into a foreign country. He let him go. Let me tell you, God loves you. And he wants you to come home. But you got to want to come home. You got to want to come home more than you're got to want wild living. You can't do both. If you're here today trying to do both, if you're here today trying to party on the weekend and trying to praise Jesus on Sunday morning, let me tell you something. That's not how it works. The prodigal son. Y'all, it's still not too late to come back home to your heavenly father. The second character in this parable is the loving father. The loving father. Um, right, let's look at Luke 15, 20. So, so the prodigal returns home to his father. Now watch this, underline this. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. That is my favorite part. Filled with love and compassion. The father did get up then, and he ran to his son, and he embraced him, and he kissed him. Now, now check this out. The father didn't go to the foreign land, but I promise you, because the father loved the son, he would look probably every day, or every time he would walk by the, the road that led into their estate, he would look longing, praying, begging, hoping the son would come home. But he knew if he had gone into the foreign land, the son wasn't ready yet. And when the son was ready, maybe, 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 maybe he will come back. Or maybe he would never come back. Maybe he's dead. Maybe we've lost him. But that doesn't mean I don't love him. And that doesn't mean I'm not going to keep looking for him. And so he was... Looking for him. And he comes down the road and it says filled with love and compassion. See, a lot of us think God the Father is like the way we are sometimes. When we've been hurt. You know, if this, if this had been me, if one of my sons. If, you know, if Zane said, hey, I want my inheritance and I'm out. And he left and then he messed up. He blew it all on drum sets and frivolous living. Because he likes to play the drums and, uh, and all that. And, uh, and, and then he comes back. There's, there's a part of me, the human part of me for sure, that I'm, I'm going to be a little bit like, you got anything you want to say to me? You, you want to admit you're wrong? You, you want to tell your mom and I that you know we tried to tell you? See, there's a little bit of me that, that wants to just make a point. Right? Because you pay the bills. I pay the bills, I make the points. Are you listening, boys? All right. That's, that's the way we think our Heavenly Father is. Hey, why don't you, uh, why don't you, why don't you, why don't you work a little harder and then we'll talk? That, that's what we think the Father says. Why don't, why don't you stop, why don't you stop, um, 
cussing and, and take your piercings out and start dressing a different way and, 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 and you know, all these things. Why don't you do these things and then, and then, and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Jesus paints an entirely different picture of the Father. Totally different. Filled with love and compassion, the Father ran. And he met his son along the way. When he saw his son take a step towards him, the father took a step toward his son. James says the same thing. When you draw close to God, God will what? Draw close to you. A lot of us, God, would you come? Would you hear me? He hears you. He loves you. But he knows when you're playing games. If you're ready to come back, I promise you the Father will meet you on the road. If the cross is anything, it is God meeting us halfway. It is God stepping out of heaven, being born in a feeding trough, becoming just like you and me. Why? Because he loves us. We do not deserve it. But he loves us anyway. And he meets us halfway. He is a loving Father, the father meets this prodigal son and he says, and, and the prodigal son, the son says, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. And it's like the father just, I don't, I don't hear what you just said because the father's too busy saying this. He says, quick, quick, servants, get the best clothes in the house. Give it to him. The guy's probably got some raggedy clothes. He's been on rock bottom. He says, get him a ring for his finger. That seems weird for you. And me, but that's the equivalent of saying he has my authority to buy, sell, he has access, he has privileges. This is not just a show. He is get the, here are the keys to the car, here's the credit card. Oh, yeah, and get him some new sandals for his feet. And go kill the fatted calf because we're going to celebrate tonight because my son who was dead is now back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And then I love this. So let the party begin, man, you know? Don't you love that? That's in the Bible, for real. And this is not a get drunk, rager party. This is a praise Jesus, thank you God for your greatness. My son was lost, now he's found. This is what the angels do in heaven every time a person goes from death to life, goes from Walking the way of sin to walking with Jesus Christ. There is a celebration and we need to get with that celebration. We need to not be ashamed of celebrating that. And that is what happened here. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. When Christy and I were starting out in Lake Village... We've been married a few years, and we lived in a mobile home, and, and, and it was a good mobile home. But we had the desire to have a brick-and-mortar home, okay? And we were getting ready to start a family, and, uh, and we prayed for this. We talked to people about it. You know, we yearned for it. We probably coveted uh, for it. And uh, I remember pulling into the church parking lot at Lake Village Baptist Church, and a woman was backing out, and she rolled her window down. And she says, hey, I'm just letting you know I'm moving, and uh, you guys ought to buy my house. And I'm thinking, well, God's answering a prayer. So we started talking. She told me the price. I couldn't believe how how good of a price it was. I went to the house, and I did see flaws in the house. I mean, you know, it was small, but it was just me and Christy then. And, you know, and and we were only going to have one child. And uh, anyway, uh, (laughs) so um, (laughs) that's funny. Uh, Anyway... um, (laughs) And so, 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 you know, it'd be perfectly the right size. And so, you know, we, we, uh, uh, you know, we were excited about it. And, you know, my mom and my dad came and looked at it. And my dad looked at me and said, son, I don't think you should buy this house. And I said, why not? And he said, it, it, it's got some problems. And I said, uh, well, thank you for your advice, dad. I'll take that under consideration. My father-in-law who's a lot more brash, was a lot more brash than my dad. Um, God rest his soul. He, he had a little more choicier words to tell me about the house. You know, my daughter and kids, grandkids are not going to grow up in this. And, and uh, that just made me gristle up. And I basically told everybody that discouraged me from buying the house to stay out of my business. Because, you know, I'm not four anymore. So one thing, we ended up renting the house for six months with the idea that we were going to save up enough to buy the house. And uh, toward the end of that six-month period, the homeowner calls me and says, Brandon, are you going to buy this house? I need you to do it now. I need you to do it a month earlier. We need to do this. And, uh, and I said, well, I said, I can't explain it. I'm not planning on moving. I don't have any resumes out. 
But there's just something in my heart. I, I just almost know God's about to move us. And I can't explain it to you. And she says, I don't care. Isn't it amazing how per- people go to, hey, brother, to I don't care? When it comes to money. She says, you, are you going to honor your word? You know, no preacher's good if he doesn't, if he can't honor his word. And I said, well, I, I'm going to, I was raised on, you know, if I tell you something, I'm going to do it. She says, well, I expect you to honor your word. So we did. We went and we bought the house and uh, closed the loan, felt good about it. Two weeks later to the day we closed the loan, I get a call from a guy I'd never heard of named Bob Harper. Hey, you ought to come interview for this church. And I knew when I hung up the phone, I didn't know how this church would feel, but I knew how I felt. I knew that's what God wanted me to try to, to pursue. I knew it. But I thought, well, we can sell this house. It's great. Except that it wasn't. <laughs> that house had terror. I, was, uh, I could go on. The bottom line was, we tried and tried and tried to sell that house for four and a half years while we lived here. So we're making, we tried to rent it, and the people that rented it messed it up. Um, uh, some kids broke into it and decided, hey, let's do a bonfire in the middle of the house. And uh, squirrels got in the attic and, and, and ate through some things and messed the, the wiring up. And the rain, you know, when it would rain, it was, a, it was a crawl space under the house, and water would get there. We had our own private jacuzzi, although it wasn't. And, um, you know, it was just bad, bad, bad. And I remember this one day, I, I was just so tired and stressed out, and we kept paying on that and trying to pay for rent here. And I was just so frustrated and so frustrated. And I remember crying out to God and saying, God, I don't know how we, we, we don't have the money to pay for this. I don't know what's going to happen. And I had asked and asked and it was like God was like, no, 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 no. That's his favorite word. I'm telling you. If you don't know God, get ready for some no. Okay. He's going to tell you no. But when he tells you no, he has a reason. He loves you. A good father will tell you no because he loves you. And God told me no because he wanted to teach me a lesson. And boy, did I learn it. But I remember the day my dad called me on his own. He said, son, your mom and I are talk, have been talking, and we want to buy that house and get you out from under it. We want to pay for your... He didn't say it this way. My dad's a little, just loving guy. Basically, we want to pay for your mistake. And so I did what every son in that position would do. Well, Father, let me pray about it. Got off the phone. I was just stalling him. I'm deep down going, there's no way I want my dad to buy that. He, I told him I didn't need him. And now he's coming to love me and, and to show me. And I remember I called my accountability partner, Matt. And I said, Matt, here's the deal. Matt knew all about this. And I said, I said what, what, do you think, what do you think I should do? And, I, you know, Matt's a great accountability partner because he tells me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. And he said, Brandon, if, if you say no, you're an idiot. <laughs> and he said, pride got you in this jam. Pride will keep you in this jam. It's time to humble yourself and come home. So... Mom and dad bought the house. I'm still not real happy sharing that with you. I'm embarrassed about it. It took my dad two and a half years. He had to fix it up. It took him two and a half more years to sell that house. And he sold it at a loss. There's a lot to learn from that story. Another sermon for another time. Just because the door opens doesn't mean God's opening it. Temptation's an open door. But let me tell you, even when you make a mistake like I did, God can use it. Listen, that's a picture of the father we have. And I know I told a long story to make a point. But that's the picture of a loving father. My dad didn't lecture me on the 20 things I did wrong. He already knew I knew. 
He was filled with love and compassion. That's the way the Lord is. Psalm 145, 8 says, The Lord is merciful and compassionate. He's slow to get angry. He is filled with unfailing love. That is the same picture of the Father in this parable. Jesus later on in, in, in um, John 3, 16 and 17 said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that the Father loved the world so much that He gave up His heir to make you and me co-heirs with Jesus He gave up His Son so that everyone who chooses to believe in Him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world not to judge it, not to say, you didn't dot the I, you didn't cross the T, you you screwed up over there, Brandon. You, You should have done this. You should have done that. He didn't come into the world to point out. He came in the world to save. And if you're within the sound of my voice and you say you're a Christian, you're a little Christ, and you're not about that, you're not playing for the right team. Because that's what we need to be about. Trying to reach people. Your heavenly Father loves you. If you're the prodigal here today, if you're the one that has drifted away, maybe by choice or just by circumstance, listen, your heavenly Father loves you and longs for you to come home. You need to come home today. In just a minute when we give this invitation, you need to come home. You need to say, everybody's going to know I got a reputation. Well, guess what? Jesus has got a reputation too. And He is greater than any sin in your life. And He paid for it all. And you would be a fool not to take him up on that offer. Now let me just tell you, the the, the parable should stop here. That is such a great story. But remember who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to the religious person. The person who checked all the boxes. The person who dotted the I's and crossed the T's who were a little bit, they were upset. How can you hang out with all those sinners? So here's the third person in the parable. And honestly, I think this is the point of the parable. It's the angry brother. Write it down. The angry brother. This is Luke 15, 25. We're almost done. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, what's going on? And one of the servants says, your brother's back. And your father has killed the fattened calf. And we're celebrating because of his safe return. Well, you would have thought the brother would have been like, wow, he's back. But the brother was mad. And watch this, verse 28. The older brother was angry and he wouldn't go in. He was so mad. How could dad do this? He wouldn't even go inside. He went on the outside. And so like the prodigal who came back on the road and the father went out to meet him, the angry brother, the older brother, was outside. The father leaves the party because he loves the brother, other brother too. And he goes out and talks to the older brother and 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 he begged him to come in. But the brother replied, all these years, dad, I've slaved for you and you never once refused to do this. I've never once refused to do a single thing you've asked me to do. In other words, I have checked every box. I have dotted every I. I have crossed every T. I have done every single thing you've asked me to do. And in all that time, dad, You never gave me even a goat for me and my friends to have a party. But you give the fatted calf to him? Him? This son of yours comes back and he squandered all his money with prostitutes and wild living. And you celebrate that? And his father looked at him and says, look, dear son. Because remember, the father loves both his sons. He says, you've always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day because your brother was dead. And he's come back to life. He was lost and now he's found. Don't you see? Him coming back takes nothing away from you. You've got your inheritance. You've got my heart. Everything I own is yours. But yet you act like I took something from you. Guys, some of us just love being right more than we love our neighbors. How can I speak on authority like that? Because I'm more like the angry brother than I am the loving father. And the crazy thing is, I was a prodigal once upon a time. 
I was the one that came to God the Father with hat in hand when I hit rock bottom and I finally gave my life to Jesus. I was the one that they celebrated that He came and, and woohoo. But after a while, after you've been with the Father, some, something happens. The devil will trick you and you will begin to think not only do you deserve it, but they don't. I don't know which is worse. I deserve it. God, you should give me something because I'm good. Or they don't. I don't know which. Both of them are bad. But that's the mentality we tend to have. We tend to gravitate towards that. There's a young man. He used to go to our church a long time ago. Over 10 years ago. He was in our praise band. And I was fearful that this would happen. And sure enough, he, he, after high school, he was going down a bad road. And he got away from the Lord. And he made a lot of decisions that I'm sure today he regrets if he was honest. And I would run into him every once in a while. We talked on Facebook a few times. And, and, and every time, you know, he, would, it, he was antagonistic towards God and faith and church and, and, you know, everything that I'm about and trying to do. And, and you know, in some of our conversations, he just wanted to pick a fight. It was like, you know, I, I, I know, I know you're, you're fake and I know you're this and that and, and just all those things. And, and, and I, rem- I saw him about a year ago post something that broke my heart. He posted a meme of a guy running down the aisle of the church on fire. And the caption he posted read, Me, if I ever come back to church. Now, a lot of you are thinking, Wow, he must be scared of God. Honestly, God's not the problem. It is, but it's not. The problem is that he would feel like everyone in the room would judge him and he would be so looked upon with scrutiny that he would catch on fire. You see, it's not the loving father that keeps people away as much as it's the angry brother. Prodigals resist coming home a lot of times because of the judgment they fear they're going to get. This, you know, he knew his dad. He knew his dad loved him and would forgive him, and it would not be fair. Because, by the way, mercy is not fair, grace is not fair. We get what we don't deserve. And then we get more on top of that. That's not fair. But if you won't fair, you won't get into heaven. I won't either. Because it's always going to be easier to be the angry brother than it is to be the loving father. And listen, there are many of you, you are the loving father. You love people. You are doing it right I look up to you, I respect you, but I want you to know, even if you're doing it right, the perception of the world is the opposite. And so as believers, we've got to work doubly hard to overcome that perception. We've got to go above and beyond to take away that reason. I don't want anybody to not come to Jesus because of me. If I am in the way, I am a problem. And many times I'm more of a stumbling block than a stepping stone. I want to close with this story. There was a young man and it came down a few years ago. And uh, I think it's probably the first time he had been in a worship service, probably in years, since he was probably a little bitty baby. They just didn't go to church. And he showed up on a Sunday morning wearing a hat. And he sat right over here at the youth section. And we all know that go to church wearing a hat uh, unless you're a woman and I don't understand, you're going to the Kentucky Derby. I, I don't understand that, but anyway, that's another sermon. I'm stepping on toes. Anyway, but this guy had on a hat. And, and I remember everybody's looking and everybody's like, he can't, he can't wear a hat. And, and, I, and I am all about re- respecting God, y'all. I really, really am. I'm all about honoring God. Listen, so, so, so here's the deal. Uh, before anybody else caught him, I caught him and I said, listen, if you're going to come in here and worship, you need to remove your hat. And he goes, why? It's part of who I am. And I said, well, we're trying to show worship and respect to God. And he couldn't understand that. And before we get all on him, not knowing how to honor God, what about us who know God and don't know how to honor him? (laughs) I don't honor God enough. But that day I made a point and not a difference. And he never came back. Listen. Listen. If we're going to be the church God wants us to be, we're going to have to love people who don't look like us, don't talk like us, don't act like us, don't dress like us, believe differently about our political system than us. Not because 
that means they're right or wrong. It's not about right or wrong. It's about lost and found. Are we going to be that? I'm talking mostly today to angry brothers, but if you're here today and you are the prodigal, you are the one that you just, I just can't, I can't come home, Brandon. Yes, you can. Do not believe that. The Father is here with open arms. Let's bow our heads and our hearts right now. If you're the prodigal, if you need to come home today, this is what you can do. If you, The Bible says that for any of us who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you will ask God to save you, He will do it. If you've been saved before and you've moved away, you can say, God, I know I'm already saved, but I have strayed away and I'm coming home. You just tell Him right now, Jesus, I believe you died for me. I have squandered so much. I have been wastefully extravagant more than I have been humble and dependent on you. And I am coming home. No matter what anybody thinks. And I give my life to you right now. If you're the angry brother, if you're, that, that's where I tend to go sometimes. I hope that you'll take the next few minutes to really just come before God and say, God, I am so sorry. Would you change my heart? Would you make me more like the loving father? Jesus, I pray that in the next few minutes, whatever you're wanting people to do, they would do it. 